So here we are. Good evening, everyone. My name is the Reverend Dr. Derek Wayne McQueen, and I'm serving as pastor of St. James Presbyterian Church in Harlem at the corner of 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue in the village of Harlem in this crazy metropolis of New York City. But here tonight, we are intimate and together, and we are doing our Bible study, which we do every Monday evening at 6 p.m., and it's on our YouTube channel. At the latest, by Wednesday mornings, we use the lectionary text, um, the Revised Common Lectionary um, that many churches use, and we delve into them. And today we will be delving into our scriptures. So let us start with this beautiful, beautiful psalm, this beautiful prayer. The commentators love to, love to sort of characterize a lot of these psalms, the people that write about these texts and the people that study them. They love to characterize it in a story um, that sort of makes it stuck in time, especially in the First Testament. But I like to sort of liven it up with a reimagination about some of these things. So this is supposed to be a prayer in old age. Um, it has a commentator mm -hmm. believing that this is an individual lament by someone aged, aged and, and affirmed. Mm -hmm. And then I looked up lament, and the word lament is to express sorrow, mourning, but often regret for and demonstratively. But what if this is a psalm of lament of wisdom, of someone watching the course of those who have lived full lives and died? and asking in life for God's grace upon their life, vowing to perform what God needs in the future. And this is just a snippet of this psalm. And when I read the entire 24 verses of it, it really seemed as if um, at the very end where they're promising to say, and if you do this, I will live my life in this way. So this is a way of understanding, putting them in the context of, I know that we're going to make mistakes in our life. But then he says, or she says in the very beginning, in you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, for you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust. O oh Lord, from my youth, upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb and my praise is continually for you. This is a, a beautiful psalm in its wholeness, but we really are focusing in what God's plans are for us from the very beginning, even before we knew who we were with our text today. Um, and so this one, and particularly, there's a, there's a petition in verses one through three, one through three, asking for refuge, of course. And of course, sometimes when we hear um, rock and refuge from the psalmist, they're talking about the temple or perhaps Jerusalem's gates. Um, and then in verse nine, it's, it's the place from which the psalmist is praying for healing, the healing that's in, in verse nine as well. So those are verses one through three, verses five through nine. And they're always worried about the wicked and the grasp of the unjust and cruel because they know the world is cruel. In verses 5 through 9, it shows divine care of the psalmist from birth to old age. And in this particular reading today with verse 6, we only get, um, we only get to the birth. But this is reminiscent of that you knew me and you formed me in my womb. Except this is at the womb and coming out at birth that we're hearing this text. But this is a, a wonderful understanding that we are nothing more than the relationship we have with God because God has always been with us. Um, that's why it's such a beautiful psalm in its entirety. Not so much about just lamenting and being sorrowful, but sort of saying that I know that I will have regrets when I come to the end of my life, but I vow that I will try to do my best. It's a beautiful sentiment because you've been with me from the beginning. I know you're going to be with me at the end. 
You're here with me now, protecting me in this, you, because you are my rock and my for fortress. I can call on you to rescue me from the hand of the wicked and the grasp of the unjust and the cruel. And just verse 5, just that first sentence, for you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust. Those are two key words in this particular psalm that if we really were to meditate on just this fifth verse, for you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Because we often forget how God serves as our hope and God serves as our trust as we go from youth to growing older. There are certain times where we're in and out of remembering when we, when we feel hopeless and when we are not hopeful, where we, it's not that we don't trust the Lord, but we forget that the Lord is there for us to trust. I would never accuse someone of saying, well, you just need to trust God more. It's just, I just want to say, remember, you can trust in God. Oh, yeah. I remember that in the midst of all my trials. That's why I think that this psalm is a beautiful pretense to be able to praise God, even in the midst of our troubles. Ooh. And like I love to say, it confuses the enemy, yes. But it also speaks to the reality that we are only in our bad times for just a little while. This is an assurance of hope and trust that the God who has been with us from birth and led us out of our mother's womb, of course, understanding that just like today, of course, um, birth for a mother, this image of birth, the mother and the child both teeter on life and death. This is the, it's one of the most precarious moments in a woman's life and in a child's life is actually birth. The lungs could stay filled up with fluid and they wouldn't be able to breathe or cry. The pain and the suffering and the taxation that it takes on the body to, to actually birth another child brings you this close to death. So life and death are this close. Mm -hmm. So it is God that is there at your mother's womb is what the psalmist is saying. Think about how many children um, in our time period, um, how many children in our time period don't make it, don't make it from birth. And African-American women, of course, are the, um, they get the least health care and the least sensibility of, of um, obst obstetrician services when they're giving children in the United States. And they're very often the most who die. And black children or black mothers are the most who die on birth because they don't have that attendance. So when you can say, it was you, oh God, who took me from my mother's womb, we have a bigger, a deeper understanding when we put it contextually with our, our statistics and our headlines today and in third world countries as well. Because you didn't have to make it. But God took you from your mother's womb. Think about it that way. Any thoughts or ideas on that? I think it's very appropriate for someone, you know, as you've been through a lot in life and lived up to your 80s and 90s to think about this. You know, these are the things you are thinking. I, I would think by, you know, you're starting to prepare yourself mentally. And, you know, you still are, reflecting on from you know your childhood your years when you were young but also you know you're closer to god you're getting closer to him <laughs> mm -hmm. so it sounds like a prayer that you can see it's preparation like a preparation pet prayer right mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. what would done hey. i was uh, reflecting on these scriptures uh during the week uh, because I prepare the bulletin for my church, mm -hmm. so I have to review them. And um, all of them seem to be taking us from birth into our adulthood, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, this particular scripture uh, speaks to me personally, because I grew up with this story about how if my mother, as a 
nursing trainee had met this obstetrician that she was, um, oh goodness, impressed with mm-hmm. in terms of his uh, his ability, his skill level, uh, that she and I probably wouldn't have made it through the birthing process, you right. know, because it turned out to be an emergency situation. And um, when you think of it in terms of my parents lived in Brooklyn uh, mm-hmm. at the time when she was pregnant, and the doctor practiced in the Bronx, and she Ooh. was going back and forth. Yes, you know, those of us who live in New York City know that that's a, that's a ride, you know? And Ooh. I was born in the middle of a snowstorm and all of that. That's nobody but God, you know? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it's nobody but God, you know, and it turned, you know, like it turned out to be an emergency situation in the birthing process. She couldn't have it naturally, you know, and all of this stuff. And, you know, so these kind of things, you're like, you took me, you know, literally God took me from my mother's womb, Mm. you know, not the natural way, you know, so, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that so so uh, for me, a uh, the some really is appealing to me in the sense that um, I when I was little, I don't know really, but I really used to love the um, the little psalm the little psalm book. I usually so I always have the psalm in my pocket. So I always I used to have the psalm. I used to always read it some and it's really used to help me um i remember during the war um these guys were um some people from our tribes they were they formed a rebel you know by themselves and because the the uh, chassis rebel was kidding our people because they said we were like um we were people we were crying uh we we were related to the former president late president Mm-hmm. Uh, though, so Charles said, carry war to Liberia to fight these people because they said our our uh, our tribe was enjoying the government at the time, which of course, and my tribe was not really part of the crown because we call Sapo, we are called Sapo, and Sapo mm-hmm. also they, they're intertwined with crown, but we're not really crown. So crown was really the big a bigger part of the uh, Liberian society, but we, we suffer, but still here they call a crime because we speak the Kwa language. So, um, when that happened, when Charles the rebel started killing us, so, uh, there was the vigilantes. So then the ECMO started supporting these guys so that we can fight the rebels, Charles the rebel, because the rebel were killing my tribe people, my tribal people. So, um, for me, I was little. I was, but my age group was fighting. So, but I was very scary. I was, I was afraid. Yeah, I never. Yeah, I was so afraid. So, um, there was a time I was supposed to leave from the village to go to the city, and I was in the city called Greenville. So I was in the city in Greenville. My uncle and I came from the bush. At the time, the rebel started the ceasefire. So my uncle and I. Took rice from the from the I can still remember. We took rice. I followed my uncle. We carry rice. He said I should follow him. We carry rice to the to the city where the rebel are, so that we can sell the rice. So when we when we were selling the rice, then an idea came to me. I said I don't want to go back in the bush. I want to go in the city. So mm-hmm. my uncle, <laughs> because I used to live in the in the city before I I was I was little, but I used to attend school in Greenville before the walking before we left the city. So um, when my uncle was going back, I said, I'm not going, I, I hate for him. So you were looking for me, he couldn't find me. So one of my friends was in the rebel group because he was fighting, but me, I just, I, I'm afraid. I don't say I'm not going to go do that. So my uncle ran up with my uncle went to the village and I went I was with my friend. So my friend put me in the room. So he would go outside because I do not, I was so afraid and because they have guns and all that. I say, I'm not part of that stuff. So he will go out and he will like say, go bring me some like a coconut, like fruits for me to eat, oranges for me to eat. And I used to go out there and I used to be reading the Bible. I used to read the Psalm. I used, that was the only thing I used to do. I used to be fasting, praying, fasting, praying, fasting, right. praying. So when this guy came, he came to me one day, he said, oh, um, 
my my commander, there's a ship that is coming from Monrovia. That uh, the commander said the ship is going to to Monrovia. Do you want to go to Monrovia? I said, yeah, my 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 uncle live my uncle in Monrovia. My, my people are in Monrovia. I want to go there to go to school. And one of my uncle was in the states, so I told him. And if guess what? This guy who was a who was a general for this for this crime guys who was fighting, he was he was he was uh, once a captain in the in, in the dog government. And my uncle that's in the states here, he was he knew the man very well. So I said, okay, I want to go to the general so that I can see him. So he said, okay, the day when the man is going to, when his wife is going to the city, when he's going to Madrivia, because there was a CRS. There's a ship that came from from Monrovia that went to Greenville that carried food mm -hmm. for these people. Yeah, so the ship was supposed to go back. So he said, when the ship is going back, then his wife will be going. Then you can go there and then talk to him. So I said, okay. So I started praying that how this ham worked for me. I never used to eat something. I would fast and pray. If this guy does not bring food for me in the room, I will not eat because I cannot go outside my friend. So I the only thing I used to do I just used to pray. Pray, 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 pray. Until this day, he came to me and said, oh, he's ready to go. His wife is about to leave. So let's go. So, I, so he said, he told me to the man and I asked him, uh, he said, why you wonder who, who are you? Where, where are you coming from? Where you, I never see you before. Where are you, where are you coming from? So then I explained to him, we're from the same town, like same pine town. So I told him I'm from this place, my uncle, this, that. My uncle is color well and this, that, that. He said, Oh, you color well so? Oh, really? You color well so? I said, Yeah, my, my father. He said, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. No problem. So, what you get to, what you, what you want to do? You want to go to Monrovia? I said, Yes, I want to go to Monrovia. He said, I should come so that I can go to school. He said, Really? Are you sure? I said, Yeah. He, he told me to come, but I don't know how to get there. He said, Okay, you know what? Then he, his, his wife had this, um, this kind of board. She was carrying more food in it. He said, I already took, took my wife. Took my wife food. That's how the psalm worked for me. That's how I fasted. And it's, the, the man, I didn't know you from nowhere. So if you said, just take the take the bow and start walking in front of us. And that's how I walked in front of them. And we got on the ship and they put us in the assistant captain room. That's how I left that place. Wow. <laughs> that's that's how like, I that left. is coming out of the <laughs> That's how I left. That's how I left grieving. It was like a magic to me. So my uncle who left and went back to the village, he said he went to people. Oh, I didn't see where your son went and this and that and that and this. He so scary like that. And and the child still rebel were coming to that city when we were leaving. So when we got on the ship and we came to Madrid, that's how I left the the beach and I went to the city. And I went to the city. I went in the city. There was no fighting. The Ekmo was dead and all that stuff all that good stuff. And then we were there for a little while. Then war started again, it process started again. Then we fled to the, um, uh, how you call it? I went to my stepfather. We went to the um, ECMO base. That's how we left and came to Ghana before that. It was so, so really some is very powerful. So very. Yeah, it's, oh my God. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible when we sort of take these, take these Psalms and we sort of, uh, put them, lay them down as a metaphor over our lives and our experiences. Um, because we are born so many times and in so many ways. And that to know that here you are as a child being led in all these different factions and all these different places and being brought out of a womb to another life into a new way of being. We just say Ashe and God bless you. And so thank you for telling us and sharing that with us. Yeah. Amen. 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 So now we have a story to tell from the motherland, y'all. <laughs> right? <laughs> About what thank happened you. in Liberia. Yeah. So thank you for yeah, sharing It that. was not easy, man. No. <laughs> and okay. it still isn't, but we're making it happen, so. Just God. Amen. Well, our next reading is um, from Jeremiah. It's from Jeremiah, the first chapter, verses 4 through 10. The first chapter of Jeremiah is, you know, Jeremiah has all these chapters, and it's talking... He, he's sort of a parallel to Isaiah in different ways, but he's a prophet and, and, and has an oracle. But here we hear the, the call story of, of Jeremiah. The call story of Jeremiah, uh, the pattern of a call story is this. And you think about Moses and you think about anybody that has been called to serve God. Here's the, the pattern of the call. 
God's identification. Um, first God calls you, then there's an identification with the task or the commission to be called to God as God's agent. So God sort of says, okay, well now you're here. Moses goes to the burning bush. And by the way, this is parallel. This calling is very parallel to Moses as well. So you go to the burning bush and then God says to you, okay, you're the one that I'm choosing. You're going to be commissioned and you're the one that I'm going to be taken care of. And then God says, now I'm going to give you a sign that you can take with you to show that you're mine. So every time somebody says, well, I'm too young. I can't do this. I don't, I can't talk right. God has this pattern or the texts have these patterns of these, um, of these call stories about God says, there's something that needs to be done. There's someone that I need to do it. You are the one that I'm calling to do it, to be my agent. I promise to be with you. Everything's going to be good. No matter, it may get bad, but I'm going to be with you. And let me show you the signs that'll help, help you know that I am with you. So here we are, and now we have this with Jeremiah. Jeremiah, um, this call pattern of Jeremiah now, um, it's just actually chapter 1, verses 4 through 19. It's the entire, um, it's, a, it's a larger section than, than we think. But here we are, this whole section where he says, um, I'm going to, I should read this first before I start going into it. So let me get ready to read that in just a moment. Um, but let me see, um, let me just close this window. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, and once again, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to, whom, to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So let's get to this. Um, throughout all of Jeremiah, you'll hear, you'll hear that phrase. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, the word of the Lord came to me saying, so it's a very, it's a characteristic of Jeremiah. But here's this, the Hebrew root of this word also means thing or matter. Now the matter of the Lord came to me saying, the thing of the Lord, the thing on the Lord's heart came to me to say to you. So it's not just saying that, oh, I heard a voice. It's saying, now I know God's plan for us. Um, the phrase new is, um, connotes a profound and intimate knowledge before I formed you in the womb, I knew you intimately. I had upright priority knowledge of who you are and what you were capable of. I designed you. The psalmist said, you pulled me from my mother's womb. Jeremiah is told, I formed you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And I consecrated you, which is really powerful. And this prophet to the nations, in this first chapter of Jeremiah, this phrase introduces and presumes that the entire book of Jeremiah, are, including the oracles against the nations, that the ministry of Jeremiah is critical in this moment in world history. Because remember, Jeremiah is also the one who is, he tells the people that God is going to take us and we are going to be sent into exile but it is jeremiah who buys the property as pure proof god tells the word of the lord came to him saying buy this piece of property get the deed do it legally in front of everyone who needs to see it put that deed in a jar and when you come back from babylon your property will be yours this field will still be here for you so there is a promise um through god that it is critical that this this 
this exile happens for the history of Israel in order for people to be able to come back and understand and reconsecrate themselves to God, which happens in Jeremiah itself. And verses 6 through 8, this is the narrative that calls, um, invites comparison between Jeremiah and Moses. Um, the editors of this book understood um, as the prophet like Moses. Um, so when he says, for I am only a boy, don't say that. I, you shall speak whatever I go to. And the editors of this book are casting Jeremiah um, as the particular new prophet that Moses himself spoke of in Deuteronomy 15 to 18. So in Deuteronomy 15 to 18, um, it reads like this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your, their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. So God and the editor of this, of this text of Jeremiah is casting him as this particular prophet that was mentioned in the Torah. So this, that's an important um, way to understand about how people are putting this history together. But this whole thing, he says, but the Lord says, uh, uh, I'm only a boy and you shall speak whatever I command you. Let's go back to Exodus 4, 11 through 12. Then the Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. Do we know who that those words were spoken to? Mm -hmm. Let me just make sure before I say it out loud. <laughs> Was it Moses? Yeah. You got it. Right before he prepares his return to Egypt for the liberation. Because remember, Moses had all these excuses why he couldn't go. And when Jeremiah says, Do, um, I am only a boy, um, let's not confuse that to say, oh, he's like a little child. He's also saying that I have no reputation, I have no stature, I do not have a voice that people will listen to. I am immature to everyone that, will, that you're asking me to speak to. God's like, you do not say I'm only a boy because you're going to go wherever I send you. So I love that because it it takes it out of the, the idea of it being just a child for those of us who say, surely, God, you can't be talking to me. <laughs> Nobody's going to hear me when I'm trying to speak the truth or speak your word. And God's like, I'll put it in your mouth and I will I'm the one sending you. And then when the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. It's the exact same sort of thing in Exodus 4, 15 through 16 now. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be your be with your mouth and with his mouth, and he will teach you what you shall do, what he's saying to Aaron. He indeed shall speak to, uh, to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your Is that hand, you, Adley? Take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the sign. Now I said, was that you sneezing? Yeah. God bless you. <laughs> so this is, this is a very powerful notion that he's going through the same call pattern as Moses, not so much for the person of Jeremiah, but for the people who are understanding that Jeremiah is a prophet. The only, one of the best ways to listen to a prophet is to have them go through the same things that happened with one of the greatest prophets. It becomes sort of like this ritual of what happens in order to become a prophet. So here is this ritual and what, what happens to most of the prophets who have a call story. And even, even the whole idea of, um, of Samuel, 
if you think about Samuel, God comes to Samuel. Samuel doesn't understand. He says, this is what I'm calling you to do. This is what I'm asking you to do. Nobody's going to listen to me. I can't tell my boss that his that his kids are going to like be disgraced because they, they're mad at you and that his family is like going to be disgraced and his name is going to be disgraced. God, I can't do that. God's like, I'm going to put the words in your mouth and tell you. And you have to do it. So there's a lack of recognition that you're being called, that you can be the one. And God bestows it upon you and you go forth so these are important things to understand about call narratives and about what they're setting up here with Jeremiah they're setting up with Jeremiah that he will be the indisputable prophet that will not only tell people that you will go into exile but that it is necessary for us to go through exile it's a different story than Isaiah's Jeremiah's is a is a text where it says it is necessary for us to go into exile because we have been we've gone too far astray from God but God is not going to leave us and God is promising that God will bring us back and when we come back we will be more dedicated to God which is what happens on his watch so this phrase where he says um I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and overthrow, and to build and plant. This anticipates the themes of, of Jeremiah, the themes of both judgment and restoration. So I am appointing you over these nations and kingdoms, because remember, Israel is in two. I am going to help you pluck them down, pull them down. It's going to be destroyed and overthrown, but I'm also going to allow you to be the voice that tells people that we are going to build and to plant. So I would, I would like to pose that um, in our world that is being plucked up and pulled down and destroyed and trying to be overthrown, that we are the ones who are called to build and to plant and to call upon God's restoration and not give up and not be hopeless because God is our hope. Oh yeah, the Psalm said that, right? <laughs> Thoughts? I always thought of this um, particular scripture as, as one that um, sort of encourages leaders as you get out there to, um, to be encouraged because God can use anybody. Yeah. You know, and so that, you know, when you feel, you know, you're too young, you're too, oh, you're too old, you know, you're too inexperienced, you're too, but if he chooses you, you are. And the thing about it, Linda, that I love about this, and what I often try and intone in our congregations is that like, God chose you before you were born. So there is something that you have a gift to give to this world, and it's just up to us to flesh it out. You have a ministry. You have a gift of ministry. You have a, a prophecy. You have a way of speaking um, of justice and truth to power that will be enlightening to, to give somebody else a chance to see life in a new way. Because um, I'm the one that formed you, and I knew it, and I'm just waiting for you to recognize it. <laughs> Mm. So it's a joy it's a joyful thing it's a joyful thing well i won't go into a real you know i don't want to go into a very long story but um it's just interesting because i did have to speak some truth to a lot of power a couple of days ago it's very interesting to be in that space mm. again and where you're really flanked by power and you know it <laughs> and you know it and um, but still in that space of that, um, being able to still speak to it, regardless of whether it, you know, responds the way you want it to do or not, there is a there is a certain level of courage, I'll say, that you speak to it anyway, <laughs> even when you're flanked. And I mean, you're flanked, you're you're outnumbered, you're but you speak to it anyway. That's why I'm wearing a tie. That's what I've been doing all day. <laughs> this is like a continuation of the epistle from last week. Last mm -hmm. week, uh, talking about the gifts. 
that we all have, you know, yeah. but they're like different gifts. <laughs> right. And I just love the fact that the song goes from, well, you pulled me from the room, from the womb. And then Jeremiah's like, God says, I formed you before you were in the womb. In the womb. Yeah. 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 And going back to my story, it's like before my mother even knew, you know, mm -hmm. had no in inkling, you know, God had already set it up for her to meet this mm -hmm. doctor, you know. Mm -hmm. And God appoints you. You yeah. know, he appoints you to do what you what he needs you to do. And uh -huh. you know, when he when you walk in that space of, you know, um, so humans and what they do and say there, it's irrelevant because he appointed me to say and speak truth to this. Uh -huh. Whether you do what you need to do, you, you stand or, you know, make your presence so that it is set up to destroy or overthrow or intimidate. <laughs> but you know my suggest guys, recommend suggest be a yeah. support yeah exactly. all those things but my guy said i i gave you the strength to mm -hmm. uh, speak to it and mm -hmm. you do and you do and no matter how much you you tr try to oh, resist man. that you know it's like you, you it's you like being to. in the twilight zone yeah, exactly. you keep coming exactly. back to that point where right. you know god is saying i told you go ahead you know right. <laughs> what, you, what you need to say to this. It's yeah. like being in. The lions are around you. It's like our gentleman here that talked about all he he went through to get where it was that he needed mm -hmm. to get. And, you know, but God was guiding him. His guiding his feet. He was opening the spaces. He said, because I appoint you to be where you are now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know. It's amazing, and, I, and it pulls me back to that wonderful title that is is out of print, but you can still find it somewhere. It's the call story of black preachers. It says, God's yes is louder than my no. <laughs> you, exactly. can't, you can't drown it out. You know, you can't drown it out. So Right. That's right. I'm Linda, I, I don't know if I think I told, I don't think you know this actually, but I have said this before in some of my testimony. When I was a child, I did want to be a preacher, but there were certain times where I was singing and it was so emotional for me. And I felt so vulnerable and so raw that part of the reason why I didn't want to, why I didn't become, go into that thing when I was younger, like a teenager, mm -hmm. was because I didn't, I, I couldn't handle that. For example, singing, um, there is a fountain filled with blood. I just remember breaking down crying and not being able to finish it because I didn't feel worthy to sing it, right? But that leaves um, you so vulnerable, right? Yes. So I said, hmm. Well, maybe it, what I'll do is I'll take up acting where you can be vulnerable with someone else's words in someone else's life. <laughs> so I switch. That's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But look at where I'm at. He's got a point. He appointed you. That's why. It was a long bigger than you know. <laughs> it's a very interesting journey to get there. Yeah. <laughs> but he got you there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And everything that I've seen you do through, <sighs> you know, the things I have seen you do in your life, um, I think are all steps. They were all stair steps to where you are now. Even when I listened to you, um, you know, a narrative you did on Owen, Owen Coachman. Mm. As soon as I heard, it, I said, "That's Derek." <laughs> 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 you no, know, because they're they're playing it. And I said, "I yeah. just I know that voice." And uh, mm. but with, when I listen to your voice now, as you read scripture, uh, it's it's it was an, it was a stair step. It was mm -hmm. preparing. It, everything was preparing you. I remember you as a teenager. Everything was preparing preparing you, because even the the teenager that you were, even in high school, still stood out as thoughtful, sensitive, deep, uh, reflective. That just stood out always. So stair steps. He was I, believe, I believe that Alita Adams was singing the words of God when she said, I don't care how you get here, just get here when you if just you get here when you get here. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. And you know yeah, that's yeah. interesting you say that because the text also makes me tie it back up to last week's lectionary. It's going to be interesting to see where they put us next week. Because mm -hmm. Nehemiah was called in his spirit, in a sense, after he heard, he asked the question, so how's everything in Jerusalem? And after he found out, he prayed and he mourned and he fasted. And he really took a chance in, um, with the king because, you know, 
You're mm-hmm. supposed to be happy. You're not supposed to have a sad face. That could get you killed. And he was very vulnerable with his feelings and saying, well, you know, my homeland is just jacked up and the walls are all messed up and everything's been burnt down um, to go from the cupbearer to the governor mm-hmm. and to be a man of compassion and to feed folk and, and to not take food for himself or land for himself that he could have taken out of the taxes. Um, so it, it, I was just thinking about Nehemiah as well in conjunction with Jeremiah and it'd be interesting to see where we land up next week. And would that be a part of the um, call pattern? I believe so. Yeah, I, yeah, I, think, I so. think so. Yeah. Yeah. So keep an eye out for that call pattern. It's very, it's a very familiar motif in literature and even in television shows, you know, even, even comedies, you know, you think about these things. Superman is a huge call story. The Matrix, you know, there have been actual um, academic writings done um, talking about how how Christian ritualized, how, how the Christian the rituals of Christianity are all throughout the Matrix. Think about Neo. He's in this this world and he has to make a decision about where do you want to be? And if you decide to make that decision, then all of a sudden you become the one that is knowledgeable enough to make a difference and make a change. And he says, I don't know if I want to do this. I can't do this. It's all about that. So that motif is a very is a very deep dramatic motif that comes from our Bible. Mm. <laughs> All right, so let's now get to um, the Corinthians text. If you remember last week, um, I sort of started reading Corinthians 13, 1 after reading our text from um, Corinthians 12. Um, and we did 12. I just want to say, I love the Corinthians. I oh, love we got the Corinthians. They they're are. So- they're, they're so today-ish. Aren't they though? Aren't they though? <laughs> they are so today-ish. They are just so today-ish. <laughs> oh. So I'm going to include 27 through 31, the end of last week's text for continuity this Sunday. Because usually when we when we preach 13, um, we we preach it in terms of like in terms of love and all this other flowery rhetoric and stuff. But I want to connect it to what Paul is part of what Paul's message is. One of the things I was amazed when I saw a, an actual um, manuscript of Galatians, there's no punctuation in Paul's letters. Ooh. It's like, it's just written like freehand and the scribes write it down freehand. There's no, there's nothing. So you just have to, it's so the letters aren't broken up into chapters. I remember seeing that. Yeah, you remember seeing that, Althea? I remember seeing that, and I remember going to the Library of Congress. Yeah. You see, and they actually had a special exhibit on um, Bibles, and you saw it handwritten, beautiful. Yeah. Um, the, they, the ornate first letter and the, the, the artistry sometimes in between, but there's no commas, no periods. <laughs> <laughs> And in, in wow. especially in the Greek, and you're like, yeah. oh my God, how do you read this? So I invite people, especially I did this in a, I do this in many New Testament classes that I teach. Um, I invite people to read this text and these texts as if you are personally writing a letter. Let the ideas come to you as you think that they may have come to Paul. We read it as something that's already written out. But can you imagine him if you were like in a movie? If you were in a movie, you see somebody writing. I did. I literally did this. I was writing this. I was writing the letter, and these thoughts came to me, and I thought, hmm. And you write them down. It's a very interesting process, um, and you start to understand Paul's letters a different way when you put it in your own physical body that way. And you think about how you, how do you write letters? You don't write letters like now you're the body of Christ and then you're like now you are the oh yeah the body of Christ and uh, individually members of it. You know you start to think about where the thought process is in that. So we're gonna read this a little bit like that, um, and then I'll go into some of the commentary around it. So I'm I'm connecting these two because remember. 
it's really, he's, he's been talking about gifts. The people of Corinth love to talk about being able to talk in tongues. That's like their primary gift. And he's saying, I'm putting it down at the bottom of the totem pole at the end of this text, at the end of the 12th chapter. He's like, that's not what's important. There's still a more excellent way. So he's done all the stuff. I know, right? Right? <laughs> Amen. Hey. Hey. Amen. And now you I don't feel the... it, but anyway, I'm just saying. <laughs> just I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't practice it, but I don't know. Come on now. Come on now. I, I don't think I've gotten that far in it, but anyway. <laughs> Well, he was talking before in um, chapter 12, you know, distinguishing the oh, gifts yeah. and saying what the head can't say, the hand can't say, I'm a hand, I'm not a part of the body. Oh, so oh, so and so then he ends up with this little, oh. um, this little wrap up. What did, that do? <laughs> what did that do? He says, now you are the body of Christ see. and individually members of it. Uh, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Now, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Uh, do all work miracles? Oh, okay. Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. And I will show you a more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and end of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Mm. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Ah, it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or, or resentful. <laughs> it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Mm. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, <laughs> they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. But we know only in part. <laughs> and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see 
in the mirror dimly. Ah, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Mm. I love that scripture. Uh, sorry if I got a little distracted from some of the sound in the background. <laughs> But do you see how that shifts a little bit of the 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 understanding of where Paul is in time trying to get these people to sort of straighten up? Mm. Some some people think that um, his praising love is in contrast to the overvaluation of spiritual gifts, and this over this giving more value to the spiritual gifts in the Corinthian church is the cause of the divisiveness in Corinth. I'm gonna say that again. The overvalue of people saying, I have this spiritual gift and I have that spiritual gift is causing the dis divisiveness in Corinth. That's what Chloe wrote about. That's what all the people were complaining about. That's what Paul heard and said, I've got to get these people back in check. So this some are saying that Paul's shift here in the, his language and the way that he speaks from now you are the body of Christ to if I speak in tongues of mortals and angels. We also have to remember that the Corinthians loved high-blown formal artful praise and, and rhetoric. There are different strata of society um, all within the Corinthian church, which is another reason why it's, it's such a, a, an incredible, the beginning of the church is such an incredible feat is because it took all the separations between classes and communities and it brought them together. But just because you bring people together doesn't mean that the prejudice goes away overnight. Don't we know that? Somebody say amen, amen. Yes, amen, amen, <laughs> amen. And that's the exact thing that he's talking about. There were, there were noble people who were in the Church of Corinthians there were Roman artisans who were in the Church of Corinth. There were slave artisans who were in the Church of Corinth. There were women in the Church of Corinth. There were aliens from other places in the Church of Corinth. There were Jewish people in the Church of Corinth. But whenever we bring ourselves together, and this is one of the things, the bane of our existence, that we have to find a way around with humanity and get out of inhumanity. Whenever we think that we are, 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 are thrown into a situation where we are sort of trying to be in one big melting pot, it is our natural inclination to try and figure out who's better and who's of more valuable purpose. I'll never forget Jerry Stiller writing his autobiography, talking about growing up in the Lower East Side, the Boys Brotherhood Republic settlement houses and things like that. And he would say, he said, you know, we were at the bottom of the totem pole because we were Polish Jews that came running from, from Germany. But before us were the Italians. Mm -hmm. And the Italians got out of the Lower East Side and they hated the Jewish Polish people. And then the next people that came in, we thought we were better than them. And now the Asians are down there and Irish people, Italians, Jews, everybody thinks they're better than whoever comes out of the projects when they grew up in the projects. Right. So this is what Paul is saying is that, oh, so, so now we have all these gifts. And even though we've erased all strata of, of, of society and hierarchy, we've erased that philosophically and emotionally and politically because we're all here under Christ. You all are trying to set up a new structure based on these gifts. And you are tearing one another apart. 
One of the things that was going on is that the rich people who didn't have much to do during the day, they were getting all the good wine and coming and getting ready for to meet for church and getting ready, ready to meet to talk and read Paul's letters and other things like that and to sing hymns. But they were the ones drinking all the wine so that when the poor people got there and got off, there was no communion wine. That Not became good. a problem. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so if you imagine the church of corinth it really is like you said Linda, it's like it it's like our, our own modern times because we keep repeating history yes we do We're and doing- even with titles I, mm-hmm. I think it's very fascinating um how the scripture is set up to um delineate the the titles and mm-hmm. um, when we think about it, he, you know, he says the apostles and then the prophets and then the teachers and and then all the other forms of healers. But he said, but everybody can't be an apostle. Everybody can't be a prophet. <laughs> everybody can't be a teacher. Everybody can't work miracles. Everybody can't do it. Everybody can't have, you know. <laughs> but, you know, look for the bigger gift behind all those titles. That's, you know, I see that so very much that. Yeah. You know, um, you know that too much is put into the actual mm-hmm. title, yeah. as opposed to the work that God is asking us to do. Amen. And some say that Paul's shift to this high-blown rhetoric, a formal artful praise and virtue, um, may be a parody to those who are fond of rhetoric, because you do have those who are at the upper echelon who love flowery poet, poetic language. But I choose to think in my own humble opinion, in my own way of just sort of understanding what it's like to sort of get the spirit when you're talking with people and when you're thinking about helping people out. I think really that this this rhetoric comes from him being a little bit more in the spirit of it all. And so it says, they hear, just hear what the commentators say. Verses one through three, Paul mockingly exaggerates both the Corinthians' favorite gifts along with his key values, and then he deflates them. Mm-hmm. So he talks about, you know, um, he talks about these, these, these speaking in tongues of mortals, but mm-hmm. do not have love. His okay. thing is love. Mm-hmm. You got prophetic powers. You have all faith to move mountains, but you don't got love, you're nothing. You got everything, you're rich and you're famous, and then you hand over everything because you say, oh, I'm in the church, but you don't have love, then you gain nothing. You don't gain the spirit of Christ. It's a beautiful <laughs> way. Of Even speaking in tongues, he, 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 he just um, downplays t- speaking in tongues to say, you're just noise. If you, yep. <laughs> It's just a noise, a yep. clanging symbol. symbol. A noisy gong, it doesn't, you know, it, it it's transparent. And this beautiful section of his writing in, in verses four through seven, when you read the entire book of First Corinthians, you know that in verses four through seven, that the positive qualities of love are the exact opposite of what the Corinthians are doing. The exact mm-hmm. opposite of their behavior elsewhere in this letter. They are not patient, they're not kind, they're envious and boastful, they're arrogant, they're rude, they insist on their own way, they're irritable, they're resentful, they rejoice in others' wrongdoing, and they hate it when somebody comes up to them with the truth. They can't bear anything, they don't want to believe nothing, they have no hope, and they can't endure if they keep doing this. But Paul says that the antidote to that is love. I love this chapter, smack dab in the middle, because he just... Let me synthesize this for you. In verses 8 through 13, in these passages, Paul is no longer um, waxing rhapsodic or trying to be give a rhapsody here um, and no longer ironic, but he's glorifying the qualities he most values while denigrating the Corinthians' most valued spiritual gifts against their present transcendence, their presence among them. Paul emphasizes the fulfillment of these gifts like we've been talking about. All this stuff comes to an end. But the greatest of these, of course, is love. Um, This whole idea of, it it reminds us in Jeremiah, when I was a child, I spoke like a child and I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. But I'm an adult now. I I have maturity and I have God's words on my mouth. 
this phrase we see in a mirror dimly. Um, I was wondering about that, so I really looked this up. This phrase we see in a mirror dimly, it actually compares to wisdom knowledge. And for us, sometimes there's a book called The Wisdom of Solomon. And it's the seventh chapter, verses 25 through 26. When it talks about wisdom, it says, For she is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and the image of his goodness. So we're trying to clean up the mirror so that we can see face to face. And Paul is using the wisdom text to say that. And this inner knowledge, we will know fully. And then right back to this whole womb language, right? I will know fully even as I have been fully known intimately. Remember to know someone is intimate and to have intimate knowledge. I have been fully known intimately and I have someone knows full knowledge of me and I will know that relationship with God fully. So whatever else y'all want to talk about after all this, just remember that the greatest of these is love. I used to think, is that scripture used a lot in weddings? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Okay. A lot of times they use them. Now, because now you understand its context. <laughs> and I I always loved it before in a wedding. <laughs> but now, now I know its context. I might be hesitant. <laughs> Well, it still comes off as a way of unifying people. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody exactly. thinks that they're giving advice to the couple. Love is patient. They do. Not, oh. not really. That's not really what it's about. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I'm like, yeah. if that's what you get from it, that's cool. I want someone who has the context of it. If if I were like a president of the United States or something like that, and at my funeral, I would want someone to read this text. <laughs> and say, here is a here is a the text that Derek McQueen chose for the United States of America. If you speak mm -hmm. in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, <laughs> right? Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. There are many ways to do this, especially when we put other things, we value things higher than they need to be in terms of God's love and, and trying to hold on to and be God's love. And you see, um, you see scripture 13, mm -hmm. uh, verse 13 on a lot of plaques and yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's another reason Linda why tonight I made sure that we had verses 12 through 27 through third chapter 12, 27 through 31. Mm -hmm. um, and go right into this. Yes. Because I wanted to keep it in that context. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And so now that we've, we've spoken about love, we've spoken about being known in the womb, we've spoken about the fulfillment of this love, um, rather than just, you know, having these gifts and you can't really fulfill the, the ministry and the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're ripping one another apart. Then we go to Luke in a direct continuation of our scripture from last week. In fact, it continues with the very end of last week's reading in, with chapter verse 21 in chapter 4. Jesus has read this passage from Isaiah. I am the fulfillment of these words. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Hmm, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Dr. Cure Yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we heard have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, 
No prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth mm. is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow of Zarephath and Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. None of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through, through the midst of them, and went on his way. This no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. He's using the specific specific examples from 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16, and 2 Kings 15, 1 through 14, that foreigners sometimes expected, experienced God's aid when Israel did not. And they were not very happy about hearing that and being reminded of that. But he was also sort of proving their point. You're talking about me nicely, but then you're going to say, well, what can you do for me? Can you do anything in Capernaum? Oh, you think I'm Joseph's son? You think there's something wrong with Joseph? Remember, if you're from Nazareth, you're like from the ghetto. So nobody nobody really dealt with you from, from Nazareth. Um, so we heard what you did at Capernaum, and oh, you're Joseph's son? Oh, please, you better take care of your own self. Fulfill, fulfill God's word of your own self. <laughs> He's saying, no prophet has ever accepted and when you say no prophet is accepted in their own hometown, you say God is not choosing you to be blessed. Mm -hmm. Let's not let's not get that twisted as well. Yeah, love is in love and need today. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. for a second. But that is that is a a a, a real powerful insult. But it's also part of the Lucan text and the Lucan story to say, Jesus ain't just here for y'all in the synagogue. Jesus is here for all of those to whom God sends. God sent Elijah to the widow in Zarephath. God sent Elisha, I sent Naaman to Elisha. So there will be Gentiles coming to me. There, I will be going to Gentiles and healing and doing what is needed to be done. And there'll be many of you here who just will not believe. And that's on y'all. But that's what we, I got from this um, text when he mm -hmm. mentioned uh, the two prophets from you yeah. know hundreds of years before. I said, uh oh, he's telling them that before they get blessed, Gentiles will get blessed. Yep. And God has been doing that all along. Yeah. Though they were the chosen people. Yep. And, you know, like, just about, you know, like in the text when it says, you know, people were speaking well of him and everything because he performed so well in synagogue reading mm -hmm. the text and everything. And, and but remember, then when he remember, speaking, Luke, remember, Luke also points out from the very beginning of this chapter that Jesus' fame has gone before him. Before him, yeah, yeah. And, you know, like when he starts expounding on the text, then it's all of a sudden, it's like, ain't this Joseph's boy? You know, who do you think he is? That That's what I got from it. You know, it's like, who does boy think he talking to? But it's gonna you know, happen I can again. hear the old ladies. I remember him in diapers, you know? It's going to happen again, because if you remember, by the time we get down to, I think it's Luke 14, mm -hmm. and Jesus is teaching the disciples, yeah. and he says, you know, there was this banquet, and you tell people the people were supposed to come didn't come, yeah. and he said, go out into the hedges and byways, and there still wasn't enough people for all that was prepared, and he said, go out again. Get everybody, get the and you get the homeless and bring all those now that we got enough people in. Let's eat. Let's loop. So it'll come back around again when he's teaching his disciples later on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this is this is that's that this is what separates Luke as a as a gospel from the other gospels is that Luke is very concerned about letting letting the people know that we may be the chosen people, but Christ is much larger than that. So it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing that he sort of slides in here and there, and sometimes Jesus is very powerful with it. Sometimes he does it in story form, like you just mentioned as well. But to say this and to do this in the in the synagogue doesn't mean it, it, if this was his trial sermon, he would not be hired. <laughs> Passed it's right over right? by the PMC. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Luke wasn't a Jew anyway right he was a greek wasn't he no 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 he wasn't okay that's the way they portray him yeah there's 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 a lot of um the there's conflation of the storytelling about some of the ways that luke has written and what we assume luke knows because of the way that he explains some of the miracles they like luke was a doctor luke was um luke was 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 not jewish but Christ called his disciples to be with him um, to sort of model the tribes of Israel as well. Um, and But this particular Luke has this, this sensibility that this is about something more. This is something bigger. Um, of course, we know Peter is more concerned with Peter's self and, you know, sort of trying to boost up Jesus <laughs> to be this great man. And we know that Judas wants him to be this military guy and so on and so forth. So everybody has their own agenda. So who was Luke? Was Luke Luke was Jewish or no? Yes. Oh, he was. Mm -hmm. So, because the the uh, Luke's gospel seems to be directed toward Gentiles more than Jews. Yeah, it's one. It's it's that's the, that's the Luke in focus. Um, the Luke in focus is mm -hmm. to sort of expand the gospel, to expand Jesus' um, visibility to other folks. But he does not say that it's, he doesn't say that the Jews aren't aren't there for, he's just saying that you're not listening. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's a different perspective. It's saying that his focus was on those mm -hmm. outside of the Jewish community, but to say that he was Jewish. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, you don't hear that. You hear, and, and it's like God. It's like God's going. God brought His Son Jesus here to do something, and whether you listen or not, the rocks are going to cry out. So you don't have to praise Him. The rocks will cry out. And think about this, and just get this imagery in your mind, and we'll make this full circle. <laughs> here they are, hovering in Him, around Him, leading Him to the cliff about to push him off the cliff, about to have him be birthed through, and he passes through the midst of them, just like a child comes through the birth canal. That was Jesus? And here, right here, they got up and drove him out of town, led him to the brow of the hill. They, the crowd went to go throw him out of the hill and to hurl him off the cliff, but he passed through the passage, through the midst of them, and went on his way. That always intrigued me. You know, like, did yeah. he just disappear? Did they get so involved with arguing among, amongst themselves that they forgot all about him being presently there so he could just walk through them. You know, sometimes that happens too, but yeah, you yeah. know. But that was Jesus they did that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Because he had insulted them in the, in the synagogue. So they were like, oh no, we're done with him. Yeah, we're going to kill them with a stone them for blasphemy, basically that's what it was. Well, not even stone them, they're gonna throw, throw them off a cliff. Throw them off the cliff, yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Throw them off the cliff. And then throw some rocks. Right, but they were gonna kill them. <laughs> <laughs> they were gonna kill him. that's, you know, very early on in his ministry. But God mm -hmm. knew him before he was even in the womb and what his purpose was. That's how it all ties mm -hmm. together, right? A lot of, of the prophecies seem to be directed toward Jesus ultimately, you know, they may have been uh, directed toward, say, Elijah, Jeremiah, you know, but if you read into them, you can see Jesus throughout all of them, you know, he's going to provide all, somebody to speak about... for me. It's all about the coming Messiah, the one that's going mm -hmm. to come and do God's work and bring God's people to where God wants them to be. And that standing tradition in, in Judaism is still there. 
that God provides messiahs and that God brings messiahs. We, the, 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 diff, the main difference is that we claim Jesus as the son of God and we claim Jesus resurrected. Mm. Other people have the same understanding as Jesus, as a prophet, as doing God's work, as speaking the truth, even Muslims. Jesus is in the Quran as a prophet. <laughs> Um, but it's it's this whole saying that Jesus is the Son of God thing that where we differ. So, like, I, mean, I think we mentioned this a couple of times, but you know, there was this rabbi in Brooklyn or whatever. Everybody thought he was the Messiah, and then when he died and didn't come back, they all freaked out <laughs> because they thought he was the he was the Messiah that they were waiting for all these years, low these five thousand years. Right, and, and they still come back. They still right. come back every and year. I, and, and Isaiah, um, and in terms of the Jewish perspective, the Messiah that he was talking about saving them and being destined to allow them to go back and build the temple, that, in their understanding, that Messiah came in a foreigner named Cyrus of Persia who allowed them to go back, that God used Cyrus to allow them to go back and build the temple. So there are all these different ways of understanding this language and understanding this. And so they, but think about how many other people may have said something that they knew the text, they knew what God was saying. Think about how many other people they may have killed that didn't pass through their midst. Mm. So the hostile reaction comes in response to Jesus' reference to Gentiles, not to his messianic claims in verse 21, where he says, oh, well, I'm fulfilled. Because later, because in, in other gospels, we have the, the scribes and the Pharisees who are challenging um, Jesus' messianic claim. And that's sort of what ends up getting him in trouble. But here in this particular instance, they want us to know that the hostile reaction is to the reference to the Gentiles, not about this. I am, I am he who has come to fulfill this, this word. But one good thing about a prophet in their own hometown is that it gives, this phrase gives you permission to get out of Dodge. <laughs> and go ahead and spread the word. This text gives you the ability to Get out of Dodge and do a Zoom conversation anyway. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But, this, but so let's hold on to those themes of God knows us and brings us through birth. God knows us before we were formed in the womb and that God has got us even in the midst of our fulfillment of what God is calling us to do, even if we may not want to answer that call. And the biggest way that we can act, the, the, the biggest thing that we can actually work on to try and be the fulfillment of God's grace and God's glory is love. Mm. Be, do, and be in love. Thanks be to God. A beautiful, beautiful night of scripture. With a wonderful history story from Liberia and there we go. Monrovia inside as well. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. I, I, you know, DT, I, I was thinking about your story about, yeah. you know, what you face because of your language group. You know, yeah. here mm -hmm. in the United States, African Americans, it's, it's mostly because of our color. You know, but yeah. there it was because of your language group. And I was thinking in terms of the, the first Corinthians 13 chapter, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> you know, even if I speak with tongues of man and of angels, you know, it, it doesn't matter, you know, yeah. unless I have love, you know. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Yes. Well, God, we claim your glory, your grace, your power and your love. Yes. And we are so grateful that 
in this constellation of folks that you want to bring together to study the word, that you knew this even before we were formed in our mother's wombs, and that you brought us through safe passage of the womb, and that you have had us hear and be in this particular spot to hear our call to love. And that in that call to love, that we are fulfilling the prophecy of a new way in a new world with the oldest trick in the book, loving our neighbors and loving God, not just as an idea, but as a verb and making it happen and doing it by our actions. May we continue to find the humility and the grace, the strength and the power to continue to do this, to grow in this and become stronger in your will and in your ways. Do this and we vow that we will continue to give you praise. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, Holy Ghost, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 That was great.